Trade. <laughs> Everybody loves trade. Even the Marquis de Saint. I'm out of words now. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you have a point there. <laughs> to pod keep our land it's what bill vandersam would listen to i'm your host aaron rennie and i'm joined by matthew naylor and i'm patrick Mian. we are a show about canadian politics parliaments politicians and policy and we've got a great show for you tonight it's june 28th we're recording here in east vancouver and tonight we're going to be talking about um the recent allegations of money laundering in bc casinos then we'll go on to talk about um the new wild Salmon Advisory Council at the BC government. Then we'll talk a little bit about how Canada has recently purchased a stake in the Kinder Morgan pipeline, and we'll finish up with some discussion about NAFTA. Now, uh, many of our listeners will know that we have taken a little break over the last few months. We haven't uh, recorded since April, I believe, um, and we have missed you. It's been it's been uh, you know a really busy time for us. I know Patrick and Matthew have been really busy with their other podcast, The Canby Report, and if you are interested in Vancouver municipal politics, do give The Canby Report a listen. It's a great show. And if you live in Vancouver and are not interested in Vancouver municipal politics, give the show a listen anyway, because it is funny and you should be. It has been far more busy than we thought it would be, because oh, Vancouver yes. is just the silly season. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's decided to be an absolutely bonkers election filled with absolutely wonderful stories. Yep. So please uh, check that out uh, on iTunes and leave ratings, both for us and Pod Keep Our Land. Right. Uh, so Pod Keep Our Land is back. We are likely uh, recording a little bit less frequently over the sum- summer months. So look for episodes around every month or so um, up until the, the municipal election in the fall. So let's dive in. Um, Patrick, do you want to give us a brief overview of what this new report coming out of independent investigator Peter German uh, is saying about the state of gambling and money laundering in BC casinos. So uh, we've talked about it before on the podcast, I think, which is the idea that uh, Vancouver, the Vancouver model became the the nickname used by international policing agencies to to refer to areas with extremely lax uh, lax controls against money laundering. Uh, And uh, David Eby always tells the story about how on day one of his coming into the job as attorney general, uh, his staff came up to him and said, uh, prepare, like, prepare for your mind to be blown. We're going to give you a presentation on money laundering. And he always says that his mind was truly blown. Uh, and now that we've seen this report, that was an understatement of epic proportions. Uh, we, it's really concerning that we have an attorney general with a blown mind running the legal system in BC. But Well, at least he's running it, which is more than we could say for the last 10 years, given the fact that this was not handled in any way uh, as this exploded. Uh, starting about 2009, uh, news articles started to report on increasing uh, threat of money laundering. Sean Holman, uh, who did uh, the public eye on Line, really did a lot of the hard work on that. 2011, he put out a bunch of articles about how money laundering was becoming rampant in uh, in BC. The report that uh, that, that former RCMP commissioner uh, German put out uh, indicates that it really peaked in about 2015 and continued thereafter after a bit of a drop off, uh, and that we just had become a hub of money laundering internationally uh, to the tune of you know I think 100 million dollars uh, a year was stated. Was stated. They said at one point a casino. Uh, they didn't say which one had $13.5 million in $20 bills sitting in its coffers uh, simply because people were rolling in with duffel bags of $20 bills rolled up in in, in rubber bands uh, and uh, were laundering them through our casino system, which the BC government and the casinos each got a cut, uh, and then walking away with now laundered clean money that these organized crime that organized crime was using for whatever purposes they wanted to. So, Matthew, really briefly, you're the lawyer. Do you want to t- tell us... Not a lawyer. What is money laundering? and why would somebody want to do it? So money that is uh, generated for a person through illegal activities is not truly justly theirs. Uh, It can be repossessed from them. It can be taken away from them. uh, They can have to pay penalties. But stuff that you win in a casino is justly won 
money. So like what they are doing is in order to clean that money, to launder it, if you will, uh, they want to pass it through a, a institution where you can actually give a bunch of money in and get slightly less money back, but in a form that you can just say, oh, I want a ton of cash at a casino rather than this is from my drug smuggling business. Right. So so the money, the, those individual bills are no longer associated with the criminal activity. No, they're associated the with uh, the casino. The casino right. and by extension, the BC Gaming Commission and, and, and by the casino, extension, us. And the casino wasn't bothering to write down the names of who was coming in with, you know, $200,000 in $20 bills wrapped in rubber bands, uh, exchanging those for chips and walking away with $170,000 in cash and having lost $30,000 at the casino, some of which the BC government would take in and some of which the casino would take in and profit. Right. And and if you haven't seen the video of, um, of some of these instances, it's really worth taking a look online. You you see the the individuals coming up to the the casino cashier with money in like shopping bags, plastic shopping bags, and they're wrapped in rubber bands, like Patrick was saying. And a regular individual going to the casino for a, a night on the town doesn't bring their cash like that. No, you you That's, bring a credit card. Right, right. If you're a high roller and you're loaded, you have a credit card. If mm-hmm. you're if it's your money and not like yeah, because I mean even even Peter German, because I watched the actual presentation. Peter German himself stood up there and he says, you know, everybody brings in twenty dollar bills. It's the most common bill c- bill of currency in Canada. We've all got a twenty dollar bill in our back pocket, but no one walks into a place with thirty twenty dollar bills. Because mm-hmm. if you're going to walk into a place with six hundred dollars, and that's a low amount of money for what we're talking here, you're going to walk in with your credit card, and you're going to walk up and you're going to tap your credit card for that six hundred dollars uh, in chips. Like that's not complicated. So and it, and it's clear from Peter German's report that this has been ongoing for a long time and people have been raising the alarm uh, mm-hmm. on a regular basis to the government and um, and no action has been taken or very little action has been taken. Turns and, out people thought that that alarm was simply the money clinking in the piggy and, bank. And, and in fact, uh, BC Liberal cabinet ministers actually did take action based on that alarm. Uh, one RCMP officer spoke out against the money laundering and Rich Coleman demanded that he be censured and be, uh, and, and be taken off the force. And he was in fact disciplined for his comments. Rich Coleman, of course, being the cabinet minister responsible for gaming for uh, much of the last government's yeah. tenure. Yeah. Rich, Coleman, Rich Coleman actually went in and he demanded discipline to an RCMP officer speaking about an issue of policing. Uh, and that is so unbelievably corrupt uh, that it's... And he in, and publicly demanded, publicly went out and said that the RCMP officer should be ashamed of his comments. Uh, that is unbelievably corrupt. And I think, if anything, it probably puts the kibosh on Rich Coleman's mayoral ambitions in Surrey, which had been rumored for weeks uh, because now he's saddled with this. So why would why wouldn't the the last government have have taken more action on this? Um, well, because of the money, basically. Uh, yeah. Everyone in let's say two thousand seven, two thousand eight, right when the Olympics were happening, and you know the globalization breezes came to Vancouver, uh, the housing market started to explode because a lot of foreign money started coming in, a lot of mm-hmm. speculation started happening uh, within uh, the city because you know, and, and our houses, right, housing prices started to explode because. Um, well, kind of a multitude of factors, but one of those factors is uh, illegal money being cleaned in BC casinos and then being sunk into a durable asset. So like buying houses. Yes, houses, condos, property. Um, property. Something it's going to increase in value. Yeah, yeah. So, something that is, one, going to increase in value, uh, and two, is like an actual thing. And isn't as super dodgy as having, you know, two, two, like $2 million in $20 bills in your closet, I guess? Yeah. Yeah, precisely. So uh, you're saying that it's that it's the money that the, the BC government um, t- it takes quite a bit of the the winnings from gaming operations. Mm-hmm. Then that goes directly into general revenue, and so there's an incentive to just let it keep happening. Well, does it go into during, Does it go into general revenue, or does it go into the gaming grants thing first? Basically, oh, I mean, you, I think it's a yeah, little bit of both. Both, um, and but, not a little bit, a lot. Yeah. But also, the, the government did. Take take act, like solid action. They also eliminated the task force that was investigating the process. Uh, the RCMP task force that was that was investigating the process. The, 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 the BC government in, I think, 2011 eliminated that task force and so didn't allow an investigation into it in the first place. This is unbelievable how bad this is. So, the, the horrible thing about this is, it, to me, almost morally taints every good thing that is done in the province because all that money that, you know, the politicians like to hand
grand out with their gaming grants checks, uh, you know, funding the Kiwanis Club and the Rotary Club and, uh, you know, the Stream Keepers. All of that is dirty gambling yeah. money. And we've, we've seen governments before that didn't investigate uh, things that they were getting a cut off. And notably, gambling is one of them. Atlantic City has had those problems in New Jersey. Uh, like Vegas had its problems. Reno had its problems. Uh, but, and this is one of the things that like came out of the German report is Peter German said that he called up, you know, the, the, the head of, you know, gambling enforcement in, 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 in Nevada and said, you know, this is a situation that's happening regularly in BC. What would you do if somebody were to do this in, in Nevada? And the, the, the individual uh, that's in charge of, of, uh, of, of policing the situation in Nevada said, well, that just wouldn't happen. And German goes, well, okay, but like, let's say it did happen. And he goes, well, you know, it really just, we don't, that never happens. Okay. But if it did, I guess, I mean, we would obviously arrest them <laughs> and, mm. and then like trace their money and go through that whole process and involve all sorts of elements of other police forces. And in BC, that person walked in and exchanged it for chips and spent it and then walked out after exchanging it back for cash. Right. So it, it sounds like there's a bit of a moral hazard problem taking place here where, um, and, and Matthew, I'm glad you brought up the, inc- the, the fact that this became really problematic around the time of the Olympics, because what happened right before the Olympics, the start of the Great Recession, mm-hmm. and BC government was trying really, really hard to keep the balance, the budget balanced as it promised it would do, manage the loss of the HST revenues mm-hmm. from the federal government, and uh, and not have you, a bad news budget and, either. Yeah, exactly. And, and so y- you can understand why you wouldn't want to draw too much attention to all of the, the billions of dollars that come from gaming and and go to support everything from our healthcare budget to our education budget to to everything else. Yeah, it's it's a huge problem, and it's b- because it BC was the only province to make it through the Great Recession without a huge dip in our economy. And that was in part because of Olympic spending. And it was in part because of the uh, huge amount of cash that started flowing into Vancouver because it was a place that cash could settle. Uh, well, and, and, you know, fiscal management. Mm-hmm. Sound fiscal as well. management as well. Yeah. And, and Gordon Campbell's bathtub. Uh, Gordon Campbell read a lot of books. He read a book about an economy is a bathtub where money comes in from elsewhere and money goes out to somewhere else. Anyway. Uh, but it's it's stunning to me the depth to which the government did nothing and how stark the report lays that out. Uh, like, it, it it actually shocks me how many times these things happen. Like, I've already said the time where, like, Rich Coleman demanded that a police officer be, be punished for his public statements. Or talked about the elimination of the integrated RCMP uh, element that would look into this process. But also, like, all of the times where, like, re- like hundreds of page reports were produced for the government saying money laundering is occurring in your casinos in vast quantities uh, and the government did nothing for years. And it's stunning. I can't even, I would never have thought that this could be this bad. And there's clear consequences. <laughs> Not only is it turning a blind eye to criminal operations, but the, the report draws the, a direct link between this money laundering and the opioid crisis yeah. and the housing affordability yeah. crisis in, in British Absolutely. Columbia and Lower and, Mainland. And when, when gangs can launder money, they can then spend that money in all sorts of other ways that allow them to in, 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 in increase their their gang activities but like and now every time we visit a community center we've got fentanyl and drywall dust on our hands because this like this has the moral culpability of this is so like frustrating to me because it it took something that like people are trying to do good with these organizations these community organizations that receive community gaming grants north shore rescue uh is one of the receivers of you know one of the largest gaming grants but like all that stuff is still being paid for by dirty money that people shouldn't have that is either drug money or from human trafficking or from other criminal enterprises or it's just being spirited out of a country uh, because Vancouver has ways of making that durable and yep. permanent. At, at one point in 2010 somebody walked into Starlight Casinos with $2.6 million in $20 bills. How do you, do you, does that require a forklift? Like, <laughs> Physically, how do you do that? Like, physically, how do you do that? And that incident, despite the person admitting it came from loan sharks, uh, it was determined by BC Lottery to not meet the criteria for money laundering. 
I don't understand how you can walk into a casino with $2.6 million of bundled 20s and for and for that to not meet the criteria of money laundering. Well, when you're talking about those numbers, I presume it's money dry cleaning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On an industrial scale. Yeah. <laughs> it's got one of those conveyor belts of... Yeah, yeah, but the new polymer bills, you just hose them down and ship them out. <laughs> okay. But yeah, it's, We've it's got stunning. to move on. Yeah, yeah it is stunning. There, There's a, a lot of recommendations that come mm-hmm. in the report as well. So, yep. so we can look to see um, how quickly the, this new government or one-year-old government implements those mm-hmm. recommendations to uh, to clean up the, but the it, gaming industry. It is it is surprising to me because I don't think we've gotten into it yet uh, that the BC Liberals are still saying that are still saying that they took action. Uh, was uh, Jazz Johal MLA stood up to uh, to rebut the report? Uh, he thanked Peter German for his excellent work and said that the BC Liberals had done considerable work to improve the problem and was no, unable to cite any examples. Also, he's only been in MLA since 2017, so I have no idea how he knows what happened before that. <laughs> it's because they sent him out because he has the least moral capab- culpability. <laughs> yeah, because he has he, he wasn't there. He couldn't possibly be able to say that he knew anything. Um, and like even like Gary Mason, who I don't think any New Democrat would say is friendly to the NDP, uh, said uh, that a few thoughts after finishing Peter German's brilliant report. Uh, one, outstanding work. Uh, he deserves a medal. Two, well done, David Eby. Three, the BC Liberals should just take a seat and not say a word on this. They look horrible slash lack any credibility and yeah it's stunning i didn't think this government that 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 government like i thought a lot of bad things with the last government but i didn't think it was possible that it could be that bad this is such a it's very benign this particular action but it's like it's it's definitely some willful blindness that is happening there but good chums i think i think we've got uh time to move on yeah (laughs) some uh something oh i see what you i see what you're doing Uh, Get right. ready. <laughs> so we want to talk about salmon. We've talked about salmon on this show. It was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know Matthew has been preparing his um, fish puns, so stay tuned for that. Uh, the Premier of BC has formed a new Wild Salmon Advisory Council. This is um, a, a multi-stakeholder council that's going to take a look at the issue of uh, declining uh, wild salmon stocks and try to come up with a list of recommendations. And it sounds like it's a secretariat how within the Premier's office, which is an interesting mm-hmm. move. That's been criticized, actually, um, because it answers directly to the Premier, and the Premier then takes action. So either uh, if you <coughs> truly believe that John Horgan does, is, it has the best interests at heart, and so on and so forth, uh, then you believe that he will take action as the, the Secretary resp- re- responds. Um, but if you believe that, you know, there will be political tinge to things, just like there is to everything, uh, then there is some criticism there that uh, the Council will be reporting to him, and he will decide what to do with that report. He may not publish it. Uh, he may wait, sit on it. He may only act on some portions of it. And some of the things that happen with us can be that the report just sits for a while. So what are the alternatives? Like, where else could the an independent council have been uh, this, created? Uh, so uh, Adam Olson was fighting for it to be an independent reporting entity similar to uh, Mary Ellen Tupron LaFond uh, had... An officer of parliament? As an officer of parliament. Uh, similar to that is an independent reporting entity to the legislature. So it would uh, table a report to the legislature. So, so my question here is, like, the salmon hundreds <laughs> <laughs> yes, the salmon advocate. So they speak on behalf of the salmon because no one else will. It's like the Lorax. Or, or the lock sax. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> wow, you just came up with that one. Nice. There's nice. no way you could have prepared that one. You just came up with that. <laughs> okay, but but so many studies and reports have already been done on yep. declining salmon stocks. This is not new in British Columbia or on the West Coast. Mm-hmm. Um, there, it, is, know, it is academics, not, it is nonprofits. Not super, it is not super old, though. Uh, one of the first major pieces of research that was done into declining salmon stocks was like 10 years ago by two different nonprofit organizations. It was a $40 million effort by a nonprofit organization in Canada, whose name I can't recall, and a nonprofit organization in the States, which is something like Save the Kings, um, which I remember because that's a hilarious name because they refer to Chinook salmon as King Salmon. What, but, but surely we don't need another advisory council to develop a new list of recommendations. Couldn't we just do a review of all the reports that have been done so far? On the- Indeed we have. Uh, we have the Cohen response. The, the Cohen report from the declining uh, sockeye salmon stocks in the Fraser River in 2008. Yeah, so let, let us think way, way back. So 2007. Was it actually. seven? Okay. I think it was seven because seven. I was completely the, forgot about the Cohen report. The, so. the disastrous year when there was like no salmon run. 
on and people were like, what the hell is well, going on? Was it Sockeye specifically? Uh, yeah, because okay. that, it's, it was Fraser River Sockeye. Yeah. Um, and there was no salmon run, and so they set up this commission because what does this ecolo- ecological disaster need? A commission, a judicial commission. Yeah. And that judicial commission, uh, led by Justice Cohen, uh, issued a number of reports uh, on and made some recommendations on the categories wild salmon policy, fisheries management, habitat, agriculture, science. And apparently every single one of those science recommendations has been uh, achieved. Really? So, yeah. Every, yeah. Everyone as of 2017, uh, 85% on aquaculture, 68% on habitat, 93% on fisheries management, which... Wait, wait, you said every single one. Were you saying things like 63%? It, every single one of the 20 science recommendations were Oh, okay. Achieved. I see. So are you saying, okay, we did those recommendations, it's time for a new report? Yeah, basically. New recommendations to move forward? Because, well, like, what my periodic checking in with the Cohen report seems to reveal is we don't really know why the salmon yep. are in the numbers that they are. The, the, like, way, the way it was described to me, uh, or the way it described to me, the way I was reading about it a couple of days ago, was we always used to say uh, if, uh, they, they, you know, on a normal run, one in ten salmon, salmon fry will return. Uh, we were seeing uh, numbers that were worse than one in twenty, which is obviously bad. Uh, and uh, we would always, like, marine, marine biologists and stuff would always say, uh, marine conditions resulted in the lower uh, return without having any idea what those marine conditions were. Uh, and so maybe it's ocean... There were conditions in the ocean. Yeah. And so maybe it's, maybe it's ocean acidification, marine. maybe it's destruction of local wildlife, who knows, but something is causing salmon to not return. Uh, and, you know, everyone points to this, the open net fish farms, which I think is a fair concern, uh, and I think that may be a, 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 the open net fish farms may be a casualty of this process as we go about trying to ensure that we have salmon. If we lose our salmon, uh, we lose all of the orcas that we hold dear in the, 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 the Salish Sea. Uh, they're an apex predator. It's usually bad when you lose those. Uh, the salmon are also relied upon by so many other species. It's one of the most most important backbone species of the Salish Sea. And so we can't afford to lose them. And where would we get all our nutritional mercury? Also, I eat a lot of salmon. Always sustainably harvest uh, ocean-wise salmon, I bear in mind. Oh, so extra um, mercury. <laughs> well, you know, the doctor did say that Aaron needed to have more mercury, so... Uh, but uh, no, again, we can't. It's in retrograde now, right? Yeah, basically. Uh, <laughs> oh god! Uh, but yeah, we can't. You're branching out. We we genuinely <laughs> cannot afford to lose our salmon, and I'm I'm pretty down with this. Uh, but it is gonna. There's gonna be economic consequences to it. Yeah, I was going to say you, you made you made like a, a lot of, of warm fuzzy arguments, but our fisheries are important, and maybe it means we have to do what Newfoundland had to do. Yeah, it, it might. It we, might mean we, we have to shut down the fisheries for an unknown period of time yeah like 10 to 20 years uh, well basically newfoundland shut it down 1993 so how many years ago was that um i don't know 25 25 so i don't so... know i don't have to math <laughs> get out get out of here <laughs> Uh, it'll be interesting to see what this new advisory council comes up with. And, and it, because there it's multi-stakeholder, like representation mm-hmm. from industry and First Nations and nonprofit yeah. and academia, et cetera, they're going to have to confront those trade-offs between the yeah. jobs from the farm fa- uh, salmon industry and the jobs from the wild salmon industry and the, you know, in the environmental values mm-hmm. and uh, other uh, in uh, economic values like forestry that yeah. also has an impact on um, on on salmon. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see if all those different players can cooperate to uh, issue some salient <laughs> recommendations. Did you say cooperate? <laughs> Uh, interestingly, though, uh, on Open Net Fish Farms, is their days might be numbered regardless of the Secretariat, because just last week the Minister of Agri- uh, the, the Minister of Agriculture uh, put out the requirement uh, that fish farms have to have uh, Indigenous approval, local Indigenous approval, for them to continue to operate, uh, and they have to have it within four years. And so, uh, for all the criticisms that this government has had on, on Drip, which I think some of them are fairly salient, uh, this one really is starting to make on Drip real in some in in one particular way. Is that you know the these salmon, these salmon fish farms require consent. Not necessarily prior informed because they're not there now, but at least it's required well, no, consent. But the, the renewal would be prior yeah. and informed. So yeah, yeah. No, that may, that seems consistent. Yeah. It's 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 a fascinating little little tidbit attached to this whole process. I wonder if uh, I wonder if there might be any partnerships that emerge out of that. Oh yeah, I wouldn't be at all surprised if some of them uh, were able to stay in that regard. Uh, there are some environmental requirements in that four year requirement too, but uh, the key one seems to be the uh, the indigenous consent, which I think is really positive. Well, speaking of of BC's coastline. Yeah, and, uh, which leaves me tickled pink. Environmental oh and <laughs> economic you're, trade-offs. You're 
Let's talk about uh, the Kinder Morgan pipeline and the latest. We this is an issue that we've talked about on this show many times, um, but uh, since the last time we re- we recorded, the government of Canada has purchased the Kinder Morgan pipeline. <laughs> I own a pipeline now. Is and you own a pipeline, and you own a pipeline. We are all now co-owners of a pipeline. How do you feel? I feel powerful. I feel like an extension of the pipeline. I feel like the kind of the clammy economic, feeling on my skin. I mean, I don't know if it's clammy the or... The economic lifeblood of the country flows through something that I own, and it's special, and it... it That's also it's not very, the economic lifeblood of the country. It's, uh, it's very meaningful to me to own this. <laughs> meaningful? Okay. Thank you. Patrick? I don't even... This was, like, the most surprising thing. You got to nationalize something. I know! Come on! It's the first time New Democrats have ever been angry about nationalizing something. <laughs> yeah, that is interesting. <laughs> Most, most people on the left are quite happy when when government purchases a service like this, but this one has some other kinds of moral discomfort. I, think. I, I, I will say Kevin Milligan laid out the case quite well, and I was surprised by this, uh, that it's a good financial uh, act, action by the government is that the key reason the price w- it was able to be attained at the price that it was was because the uncertainty of whether it would get built with the federal government owning it uh, in terms of a short to medium term investment, it is a very good investment. For the, gov- for the government on an economic level. Uh, but I would say that on the, the medium to long term survival of our civilization, it's a little bit more bleak. You're talking about climate change. Yeah. Climate change and spills. And, and spills, spills and, you know, those, 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 those orcas that I was talking about right. earlier that I like and that we all like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so let's back up a little bit here. Kinder Morgan Pipeline Project, of course, has been in the news quite a lot. It's, Maybe we should, uh, we should probably stop calling it the Kinder Morgan Pipeline Project because yeah, it is no point. longer owned or rather... <laughs> it's it, the Canada Trans Mountain yeah, Pipeline yeah. Project or, now. Or, or as uh, as I so delightfully heard it called, the Kinder Morno Pipeline. Ooh. <laughs> Uh, but it, it is the Trans Mountain Pipeline and Twinning Project that we purchased. So we not only purchased the uh, expansion, which doesn't exist yet, but a lot of work has been done on. But the 1956 original pipeline. Yes, which yeah. is incredibly profitable and decently well run. Right. So It only you know, leaks every once in a while. Yes, and, and those leaks are and it do and uh, documented, and you can go and look those up. Even if the whole thing falls through, taxpayers now own a very profitable asset. Yes, and that was that was Kevin Milligan's main yeah. point was that it this is this is a fairly safe investment as investments go for the federal government. It's not going to stop the federal government's cash flow assets. It's yeah, like I disagree with this vehemently. Don't get me wrong, um, but like it seems to be a, a, from a fiscal measure not unreasonable. Also it, means uh, Canada owns the risk. So yes. if <clears throat> that spill does. Happen. Um, well, we always own the risk to clean it up. We always own the risk. Alberta's right? Alberta's mm-hmm. le- learned firsthand the idea of all those orphaned orphaned oil derricks, where there's all these oil derricks all throughout Alberta that companies that were shell companies have gone out of business and left them there, and then the government is in charge of cleanup. Uh, or the ex- actually had a, a problem with this in Calgary when in like right before the 2008 recession, uh, there were a bunch of office towers that were started in downtown Calgary, and then all those companies went bankrupt, and then about seven months. Months later, the empty shells, literal empty shells of uh, these, you know, never to be built office towers, started creating sinkholes in downtown yeah. Calgary. Companies don't have an, an, a, any economic plan for environmentally cleaning up things afterwards. Mines don't do that. Oil well, oh, like like oil derricks don't do that. These pipelines don't do that. The, the cleanup of that pipeline is going to be on us one way or another because all that'll happen is uh, even if it was a Kinder Morgan asset, they would when that pipeline needed to go under and out of business, they would hive off the company and into a new company, allow that company to go bankrupt, and that company would declare bankruptcy, and, and the and the assets would become owned by the government anyways. And the government would have to clean it up as it is. So is this the optimal way for there to be a pipeline? That assumes there's an optimal way for there to be a pipeline. No, I'm just saying that either there is going to be a pipeline. Well, there, there has to be some pipelines. Like, you can concede that point, Kay. Yeah, wasn't isn't there that pipeline in, in, the, in, in, in Holland that runs beer from one end of the city to the other? I'm down with that one. You can <laughs> YouTube it. They built it. It's really cool. It's in Bruges or Bruges, Belgium. Oh, I hated but, Bruges when I was there. 
To your point, Matthew, I, I don't think so necessarily. Like, I think government is moving in the direction of requiring companies that want to do these large projects to have some kind of insurance or yeah, deposit set aside plan. To, to pay for any kind of accident or cleanup. Yeah, okay. That, that is what that is trying to, to get. Like, mm-hmm. is, it, is it preferable to have public ownership of these like major national strategic assets? And I think there is a case to be made for that. Uh, or is... Oh, that'd be still my new Democrat heart. Or is there... Um, uh, a case to be made for like developing a new and more robust indemnification system for you know the eventualities yeah and I think like that's where I get it and this is another point where I get a little annoyed by a lot of the really anti-pipeline people because like I'm anti-pipeline um, but like a lot of the real anti-pipeline people that say that we need to keep the oil in the ground is I say yeah let's keep the oil in the ground let's bring in exorbitant carbon taxes let's bring in severe re- regulations on emissions and emissions and, and fuel efficiency standards uh, let's do all that. So at least we're bringing, we're bringing in income from the consumption of that oil. What I don't like is this 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 plan that exists to sort of prevent the the expansion of pipelines because that'll make it more keep it a high price of oil. Uh, I think that that's a, a almost like a, a, a that's a bad way to go about pricing oil. And I think a, a um, misinterpretation of what Canada's role is in setting the global market price. Interesting. I mean, I guess. But local areas are purchasing our oil, and yeah. Well, specifically Vancouver. That's the other case for the pipeline is that like there's only one pipeline that comes, and while the Kinder Morgan or rather the Trans Mountain pipeline is actually uh, quite useful in that it can ship not only Dilbit but also gas, uh, like refined materials, uh, which is unusual for a pipeline. Uh, the having a little more capacity would ease some of the concerns that Vancouver has had recently because of the shutdown for repairs of its gas production. Uh, uh, refinery. So I, I want to tell a little bit about the story of how we came to own this pipeline. Um, so back up <laughs> a couple like, of months. I'm still so confused that I own a pipeline. <laughs> yeah, right. So 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 the debate we've just had has uh, explored a little bit of why this this twinning project is controversial. It's also controversial because of um, the the increase in in tanker traffic that mm-hmm. it, that w- it will cause in um, in the Vancouver uh, Harbor area and and. Um, uh, it's also controversial because of the impacts on Alberta, whether this pipeline happens or not. And politically in Alberta. And politically in Alberta, right. So um, uh, Premier of Alberta made a deal with uh, Prime Minister Trudeau that if the uh, at least one pipeline project got approved, uh, she would, Premier Notley, would sign on to uh, a carbon pricing, um, or a carbon tax, rather, program at the federal level. So in order to make that happen, uh, Trudeau's got to make the pipeline happen. And this is also uh, uh, playing into provincial politics in Alberta, where um, Rachel Notley is is the first NDP premier in I don't know ever well, first non progressive conservative premier since yeah. nineteen seventy one yeah yeah, yeah. and sh- she's got Jason Kennedy from uh, Kenny from the Conservatives um, uh, criticizing her constantly so so there's a lot of different political um, pieces at play here and the BC government pledged uh, to to not allow this this pipeline to go through and they've launched a reference case and I wonder. Matthew, if you want to tell us a little bit briefly about what a reference case means. So if you've been following the news coming out of the Supreme Court uh, in the United States recently, uh, you might have heard the idea of plaintiff hunting. Uh, and plaintiff mm. hunting is a, uh, a thing that interest groups will do where they will try and find individuals uh, to challenge a law uh, based on their circumstances and then the fact that they have standing, uh, i.e. standing before the court to argue the case. Uh, in Canada, a government doesn't have to do that. The government doesn't have to, like, find uh, a reason for... Uh, to go to court. To, to go to court. It can just ask the court. Right. Uh, it can do a reference case, and some of our most important decisions in uh, Canadian history have been reference cases, like the reference RE secession of Quebec, or reference RE same-sex marriage. Uh, these are, like, a really, really important governmental tool for a dialogue to happen between the judicial and executive legislative branches. And the reason we wanted to have, or the reason the Premier wants to have a reference case is to test provincial versus federal jurisdiction here. So yes. we know 
that the Constitution tells us that uh, federal government has jurisdiction over waterways, and, but provincial government has jurisdiction over the environment. But these ideas of it's jurisdiction sh- were determined uh, back when Canada was being mm-hmm. formed, and we had a much different understanding of uh, environmental harms. We didn't have oil pipelines yeah. at that time. And I really, I just, I really like the idea of the test case because it means that you can actually say, okay, you know, we haven't really come to real head on this one yet, but courts, can you tell us what we can and can't do? Right. So it's, you just go to the judge and you say, what does the Constitution actually mean here? Yeah. For example, when Paul Martin uh, asked reference our same-sex marriage, uh, the court, he basically asked, is same-sex marriage constitutional and is it mandatory? And the court was like, yeah, of course you can do it. You have the constitutional power to regulate marriage, but it also is parliament that grants rights. We're yeah. not going to do your job for you. Mm-hmm. If you want there to be same-sex marriage, go legislate it. Yeah, and so I think it's it's, it's a really cool Canadian quirk, because normally we would have to have this big argument, and then one side would have to sue the other and take that all the way to the courts, whereas now you can be like, yeah, we do still we still do, do that. that, we still do that, but but in, in, in a test case, what you can just do is, hey, here's the here's the facts we can of what's pull happening. Pull an argument out of the ether. What do you think? And that way you don't have to get muddied by the actual actions of the, the case at hand, you can talk about the philosophy behind it. I think it's really cool. Right, so BC government launch is this reference case. Meanwhile, protesters are pushing to stop to block the pipeline expansion. Alberta is pushing really hard for the pipeline to take to happen. And the the private owner, Kinder Morgan, is saying, if we don't get this resolved by May, we're out. We are going to stop work on this project. We don't want to spend money if we don't have a certainty that this project will go through. Which, which by the way, was a shakedown in every possible way. Yes, that, but also something that the business community has been warning about for years. Yeah, but that was clearly a private company realizing they could get big bucks out of the government and reali- and doing it. That was not anything other than uh, cynical playing politics uh, with the with with the government and yeah, they, but I think I think that they were kind of asking for a situation in which they could um, both have their cake and eat it too, like that they would have this sort of indemnification that would involve basically the opportunity to shake down the government at some point in the future. And uh, the Trudeau government saw the mouse asking for a cookie uh, and decided that if there was going to be milk distributed, it was going to be through its own damn pipeline. Thank you very much. And. Kinder Morgan did well. They got $4.5 billion out of the Canadian government. And uh, that does mean that Canadians now own a very profitable asset that has the potential to make even more money if it does get twinned. But it also is $4.5 billion that could have been spend, spent on other important priorities. Well, no, actually, that, that's, that's something, sorry, that's something that's been said no. a lot. That's something that's yeah. been said a lot. And this is this goes back into this, the, the, this uh, Cameron Milligan point is that uh, – when the government builds that money, what they're going to do is they're going to build the asset and they're going to build the cost of purchasing the asset and they're going to build them one for one. And so uh, for flow of money purposes, you're going to have no real effect, uh, effectively zero effect on the government's flow of dollars that they can put into the next budget. It is a, a common misconception. It is really it is something that has been said a lot. But uh, basically what happens is uh, the government borrows and, borrows and moves money based off of its, its sum of assets and revenues. Uh, and the asset of Kinder Morgan Morgan will count as a revenue, and the cost of buying the Kinder Morgan will cost of, it will count as a as a cost as as a as a, as a, as a, as a what's the opposite of revenue? Expense. Expense. Thank you. I'm not an economist. Uh, I just listen to them and parrot them. Uh, and so when you have the the revenue of of the ownership of this and your capital, sure. and you have the, the, the expense, thank you, uh, of buying it, you have zero zero. And so it's a the, for it should not affect the ability to spend anything at the federal level. And it and it so it won't have an effect on the overall balance of public accounts. Yes. And so okay. the, the government will be able to buy and sell whatever they want to to the same level as they would have if they had not purchased the pipeline next year. Interesting. It's a, it, it, Governments do not run their books the way humans do. Uh, yeah. And that's why whenever I see that stupid meme on the internet about how a uh, family doesn't do this or that, mm-hmm. and so why does a government do it? I'm like, that's not how governments work because families can't print their own money. Right. Yeah. Unless they want Good. to wrap Good. it up in elastic bands and take it to a BC casino to launder it. <laughs> Um, so 
Any other final thoughts on uh, Canada's new pipeline? Hey, do you think that um, now that the Canadian government owns the pipeline, the adv- advocacy groups, the community groups, will be able to get further concessions from government in terms of environmental regulation or um, distribu- distribution of uh, revenue? It's a good no. question. No? That's a really good question because I think we are, you know, thir- 14 months, 15, 15 months away from a federal election. Uh, and the federal government has a bucket of seats in Metro Vancouver. And they have four seats in all of Alberta. Uh, oh, those Calgary seats are doomed. And then they're they're going to lose them all anyways, no matter what, how fast they build a pipeline. Uh, and so maybe, yeah, maybe you're right, is that the federal government may... Yeah, I think you're onto something. Well, I just mean, like, maybe all the staff on the pipeline will now be unionized and they yeah, will have could, the same benefits as other government workers. I, I don't know. Yeah, I could see I could see the government moving to try to green the greenwash the pipeline and... Uh, as an attempt to, you know, get those Vancouver voters back on side. And I mean, there are, you know, just like with Site C, there are people that will literally never vote for that party again because if this is their issue. And there are people that are angry about this issue, but they'll waffle. I am proud of the Trudeau government because, it, like, this one to me seems like a situation where it stopped being as much about the, the policy as about the federalist argument. Uh, at least in my, from my perspective, it's like we either have the ability to create this major federal project or we don't and we can't build anything and it just felt very symbolic and representative of uh, Canada's ability and uh, to do things and achieve stuff. Uh, and so I'm glad that they have actually like put their stamp and seal on something and uh, this project will get built. Do you think this is a better outcome than if Kinder Morgan had held on to it and just it made it happen? It certainly has the potential to be a better outcome. I am actually really interested in who ends up owning the pipeline I was just at the end that. of the day yeah. Yeah. because there has been this First Nations consortium uh, yeah. that has expressed uh, interest in purchasing it mm-hmm. in, uh, in and in alliance with some communities along the pipeline the, route. The, the feds have made it very clear that it's as soon as it's as soon as uh, completion is done, they want to sell it uh, because at that point they'll be able to make a profit. And why not offload the the the, 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 the pipeline? This is an actually very different way of like doing major public projects. It's like the opposite of a P three. No, it is. <laughs> it's, hey, company, you want to build a thing? We'll build it for you. Sell it back to you at a profit. That is like the literal opposite of a P three, where a gov- gov- where a government is like, hey, company, we want to build a thing. How about we give you five times as much money as it would cost us to build it? To build it and then you can build it for us and then it'll suck more than it would have if we built it another word for it is corporate bailout Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah (laughs) um yeah the preemptive corporate bail bailout that's what one of the p's and p3 those coke brothers really need the bailout uh do you airplane over like (laughs) the arctic (laughs) wow i thought i didn't like them Do do you think this will um make it more or less likely that the pipeline will eventually get built or the twins rather i i I was pretty sure it was going to get built regardless um but probably more likely the federal government has more levers to make it happen now yeah i think yeah okay any final thoughts i own a pipeline like 36 millimeters of it i think <laughs> that's a lot more millimeters that's that's a cent that's three and a half centimeters yeah uh that's a lot more than i thought i'd ever own in my life uh i am i'm blown away by how the iona pipeline meme has has crossed the country uh and it I think, actually, no, my final thought is uh, something I mentioned before the podcast was I was listening to the Pollcast today, which is based in Ontario, and they were talking about how how much the pipeline issue had been completely preempted by the tariff war within about a day or two of the pipeline being bought. Uh, and I was listening to it, and I was like, no way. That's not true. No way. And then I remember they're in Ontario, and we're in BC, and I really realized that this pipeline thing is very much a South Coast BC thing, and I don't think the rest of the country gives a fig. Uh, well, well, I think you've spawned a whole new topic there that era for with america i think a lot of people uh who have come through the last i don't know 10 15 years thinking uh, having a lot of reservations <laughs> about free trade and globalization are now finding themselves under uh the, in this situation where they're kind of like uh, actually free trade is good let's not bring all these protectionist barriers up what a, what is all of this nonsense coming out of um the united states around uh, uh renegotiating nafta etc it seems like a lot of people who who had a negative 
negative opinion of globalization and trade, uh, envisioned an alternative that was more like a utopia and not like the 1930s. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I'm, I'm kind of getting at. Um, I, I don't, when, when I was studying political science in university, all we learned about was like the, the negative impacts of globalization and how we all had to be really concerned about free trade. But uh, yeah, you're right. We envisioned an alternative where people could still move freely, capital and goods could still move freely. A post-capitalist economy. We had one at the end of history. Access to tax dollars and could have you know labor standards across the whole world and and well, and sort of stop the race to the bottom and yeah we've I, got this other alternative uh, facing us today. Yeah, I also think we. Ne- I think you're right in that, but we also never envisioned illiberal democracy. Like I think the rise of illiberal democracy, which Donald Trump perfectly encapsulates at this point. Uh, I don't think anybody ever expected that. Nor the like in, impossible to determine where he's going to go rate of it. I think that we anticipated with a closing of free trade walls, like those that we're advocating for, like the reduction in free trade, we're anticipating a coherent process of tariffs and boundaries uh, that were consistent and existed over time and operated, I think you're right, in like a, a, a utopian manner in like in a way that we, like maybe a more or benevolent manner than, than it would have but we certainly didn't anticipate this sort of like, I'm going to just give 25% tariff to China because I feel like it, that we're seeing now. And that, I think, is something that we could not have possibly foreseen. And I don't think anybody in that was fighting against free trade ever thought that that would be the outcome. Yeah, no. We should back up here. So uh, we wanted to have a little bit of a discussion about what has happened uh, over the last few months with regards to the NAFTA ne- renegotiations or modernization process. So first of all, uh, Canada, US, Mexico hadn't did not reach the, the deadlines set by the Donald Trump. Extremely to, artificial deadlines. <laughs> to well, no, 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 no. Hold on, hold, hold on. That, that one actually is a deadline. Oh, uh, the deadline for the congressional elections yes. based on the Senate. Well, yeah. there is a Senate calendar in yeah. the United States, and there would have had to have been a certain number of sitting days in order for a deal of this sort to get its necessary, I, I think it's two-thirds ratification by the Senate for treaties. It might just be 50%. I'm pretty sure that, that it's, everything's 50% now. Um, treaties are sometimes different. Um, it, I'm so not going to... related to congressional and Senate yeah. elections and the Mexican presidential election. Yes. Uh, so coming up against calendar deadlines and like political deadlines, apparently they were close at one point. Trudeau and Mike Pence had a phone call where Trudeau offered that he would go down to Washington and have a signing ceremony uh, the, the issues over steel, aluminum, and auto parts had largely been worked out. Softwood was safe, even though it's not, strictly speaking, part of the NAFTA agreement. Um, dairy, we managed to keep our really stupid supply management system, so woo, success for the government. But uh, the American president insisted on a five-year sunset clause, which is like saying, no, actually, please don't invest in this economy. Uh, all your base will belong to them in five years. So some 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 difficult sticking points didn't reach a, a negotiation. The negotiations are purportedly ongoing, um, but in the meantime, Donald Trump has imposed steel and alum- aluminum tariffs on uh, I think all countries, right? European Union and um, I, so in China, but China was before, yeah, and then and then more after, and, and then there has been also a uh, imposition on the three blocks that were exempted from the original um, tariff issue, uh, which is Canada, Mexico, and the European Union. Right, right. So and the, the, the argument for these tariffs was absolutely amazing, was under WTO rules, uh, you're ab- and I think NAFTA rules as well, you're able to exercise tariffs uh, in interest of, interest of national security. And so, and sometimes you can uh, bring in uh, tariff rules and you can argue things like ensuring your agricultural industry exists so that you can, you know, have a domestic food security. Uh, and so he brought in uh, these steel tariffs on the interest of national security against a country against countries that America has been allied with for between sixty and hundred years, depending on the country. Oh my God! They built some of our steel plants. Like they literally, built, they built the steel plants so yeah. we could make them airplanes and make ourselves airplanes. You know, so this, we could fight in the war together. You know, the two countries that are the most intertwined with each other in the history of countries, Canada and the United States. Uh, clearly, they need to maintain their national security of 
of steel production against their Canadian northern menace. They built the Alaska Highway so that we could get aluminum to them. Yeah, but no one uses that highway. So so what, what happened after those tariffs were announced uh, was Prime Minister Trudeau uh, said, we don't really like this very much, please don't do that publicly. And then President Trump went on Twitter and called the Prime Minister of Canada weak and all sorts of uh, yeah. unflattering names. And then one of his political staffers went on TV and said there's a special place in hell for people for pre- like Prime Minister Trudeau. It's a good special relationship we have with that country. It's 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 troubling. It really is uh, to, to think that we went from being such strong allies with the United States, and I think we probably still are, to hearing that we're considered a national security threat, and then have, having you know your head of state. But well, we also surgically or, responded. Or head of government, yeah. rather. We also surgically responded with a number of tariffs of our own, right, uh, against all manner of things that red states produce. Uh, which I think is an amazing action, uh, almost entirely targeting it against Republican states, um, is probably one of the most politically savvy things you can do, uh, a- a- including uh, Jack Daniels uh, whiskey, uh, for those that enjoy it, is going to be more expensive, or is now more expensive, uh, and uh, sleeping bags. Really? Uh, there is a company that exports sleeping bags to Canada. It is located in Utah, and it employs 33 people, and we've levied a fairly heavy tariff on them. Um, so the these are retaliatory tariffs, and they are permitted under uh, the WTO's Oh, yeah, the structure. WTO is all about being able to clap back. Well, like, so basically what happens is we submit the amount of, of tariff that is going to be imposed on Canadian products, steel and aluminum, uh, and because uh, the U.S. sells more steel and aluminum to us than we sell to them, we uh, also can impose a bunch of <laughs> other uh, tariff restrictions on some other goods, and we have used that breathing room to impose things on <laughs> maple syrup, among other things, and frankly, I was surprised to learn that Canada was buying U.S. maple syrup, but... Oh, yeah, Vermont, it's a back-and-forth thing. Okay. Not that Vermont buys our maple syrup, but never mind. So those tariffs go... Uh, come come online in January, or... July 1st. July 1st, I believe, so... Happy Canada Day! Get your sleeping bags before Canada Day if you need them for the summer. And Jack Daniels. And your Jack Daniels and your pickles. Although, why you would be drinking Jack Daniels on Canada Day blows yeah. my mind. Come on. The, the European Union was very, very, uh, like, specific in this, uh, and I love uh, Jean-Claude Juncker uh, John Paul Juncker's that's a fake name uh, response he was, he was saying well this is stupid but you will see we can be stupid too we have to do the stupid tariffs and here they are uh, and so they have imposed not only you know retaliatory steel and aluminum tariffs but also tariffs on Harley Davidson motorcycles which are made in the district of one speaker Paul Ryan and Kentucky bourbon and blue jeans <laughs> And now Harley Davidson has relocated one of their plants to Europe in, in response so that they can continue to sell uh, Harley Davidson motorcycles in Europe without having to deal with the tariff, of which Trump is not happy. Which Europeans are buying Harley Davidson motorcycles? Because I. I think it's big ABBA fans in Sweden. That seems like a good overlap to me. <laughs> they came out with a new album, eh? Yeah, that's what I meant. All right. So, so what do you make of this rise of protectionist measures? I am horrified. I don't because know. Because it will lead to war. I don't know. I, are you I, scared? No. I, I think... You are not afraid. I mean, yeah, I'm afraid because this administration sucks and everything about it is vile. Um, but I have no idea if this is the thing that is leading us on a path to war or if this is a distraction from all the other things that are happening. And, I, you know, it's... it's <sighs> Trade wars have happened before. Nixon brought in similar trade wars as Trump is doing now. These things are not wildly outside of the norm. They're just outside of the norm for our life lifetimes, um, which, to be fair, can be considered wildly outside the norm. It depends on if you're talking to a geologist or somebody that studies the life cycle of fruit flies. Uh, and so, how long? How long do rocks live? I guess you know it's it's interesting. The three of us are about one NAFTA year old. No, we're significantly more than one NAFTA year old. We're like one point three. NAFTA years old. One, one NAFTAs? Yeah, we're like 1.3 NAFTAs We're old the same each. age as NAFTA-ish. Are no, you, NAFTA was 93. You're counting the Free Trade Agreement of the Americas, I take it. The FTA yes. in 1986, I want to say? 1984? Yes. Okay. I was thinking NAFTA 1993, I think. Anyway, yeah. you well, were we've... making a point. Um, yeah, I just, I have no idea if this is the thing that's leading us to the dark and be- brutal end of human civilization, or if it's going to be something else. Like There'll be a bright flash before that dark and brutal end. Yeah, but... and so like, I think it's just as likely that, uh, I don't know. Like, I have no idea how this thing ends, but this is another piece of news. Anger, 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 anger. 
So it could it could just be a blip. It could be Donald Trump distracting from all the other things that yeah. he's trying to distract us from. I, really I, I also just know. don't care that much about international trade, I have to admit. Like, I realize that it probably impacts my day-to-day life in a way that I don't realize, but I just I can't get it up to care. You live in Vancouver, where one in five jobs is dependent on the port. None of that's coming from the States, though. Yes, it is. We ship oil. Never mind. <laughs> At least none of what I think is coming in is coming from the States. I don't look it up. Well, it, it is going to have a the steel and mm-hmm. aluminum tariffs is are, are already having implications for manufacturers in Ontario, and that is uh, leading into some interesting federal politics between That's the true. Conservatives and uh, and the Liberals, and assuming the NDP as well. Although I haven't heard as much. No, the federal NDP aren't really a thing. <laughs> um, it, it it will impact uh, a lot of employers in Ontario, and Ontario is the uh, biggest economy in the country. Mm-hmm. And uh, like it'll impact consumers as well as the price of steel and aluminum products go up, uh, including, depending on how much soda you drink, oh, I guess that's buy a, cents a can. Would right. that affect carbon fiber bicycles? They're kind of in the market. Get us in. No, carbon fiber's not steel, is it? I f- no, it's carbon. Those are different, right? It's carbon in, like, an acrylic. Um, okay. At any rate. Any final thoughts? Or tariff rate, if you would. No. All right. I think that's probably enough politics for one day. What else have you guys been thinking about? Nothing. I... Only politics. No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to a trip to Vancouver Island that I'm taking this weekend uh, to just hang out and do stuff in a place that is not Vancouver, which, while lovely, is a place that occasionally you need to get away from. <laughs> it's true. I've been getting away from Vancouver a lot in the month of May. While we weren't recording Podkeep Our Land... I went camping four weekends in a row, and it was amazing. That That's is amazing. what I've been thinking about. Um, for me, uh, in a week or so, I think it is, I'm going to be going to IQ Mania, the second uh, annual uh, contest, which is uh, the biggest pub trivia tournament in uh, Vancouver that you can go to uh, annually. The winning team gets $1,000. Uh, last year, my friends won it at their table, and our team is going to try to give them a run for their money this year. It's a uh, very similar team, so we will likely, again, not win. Um but uh, IQ uh, IQ Mania uh, 2000 the second uh, is coming up in about a week at the Biltmore, and I'm really looking forward to it. Bring it on! We, my team will. You guys have a table at uh, IQ Mania? We have we have uh, entered this year. Yes. Well, you guys will be battling it out for us for I think third or fourth place, uh, and I'm fairly positive my good friends uh, will manage first place again. Is this how? Is it? It's the music heavy bit, right? Uh, well, last music. year they brought in a uh, all woman, uh, mostly person of color live band to do covers, uh, which was super it, cool. It doesn't matter. One of our, the, the other friend's team that we're, we're talking about has this person who knows all the music that has ever been written. Well, we'll have to report back on whose team wins. Yes. One of the best pub trivia um, questions I ever had was, here are four different kinds of weird flavored potato chips. Guess what flavor each one is. That's pretty great. It was really hard. That would be difficult. Yeah. I really liked when I was in, in uh, Thailand, they just had countries, like national flags on the, the front of the lays uh-huh. and I'm like what does what does China taste like <laughs> turns out shrimp huh, who knew who knew well I think that's all we've got for you today thank you so much for listening to pod keep our land time for us to hit the road <laughs> That's that was another salmon pun. Um, uh, please, if you enjoyed the show, uh, subscribe, uh, share it with all your friends, and uh, leave us a comment or a review. We really appreciate it when you do that. Five star reviews, please. It and, does actually really help us out. And and you know, if you want to listen uh, hear about a certain uh, topic, do get in touch. Let us know if you if you want us to talk about uh, a specific Canadian politics topic. Um, so thanks so much for joining us tonight. I'm Erin Rennie, your moderator. I am Matthew Naylor. And- and I'm Patrick Meehan. We'll talk to you next time on Podkeep Our Land. Good night.